So it may not seem like a big deal to get your cell phone in the right mode and to turn off social media and to start spending time with their family and turn the TV off an hour before you go to bed until you realize you were created for a purpose, engineered for success, you know, it's endowed with the seeds of greatness. You've got all these things in you. God has big plans for you. And the only way you can reach your capacity, the only way that you can fulfill and claim the territory that's yours, change the lives of the people you come across is if you go to sleep knowing you're waking up with a purpose. From cave drawings to family histories to stories around the fire, humans crave order among chaos, connection amid isolation. So we tell stories. Our mission at the Storytellers Network is to bring the art of story to the masses. Whether you are in marketing, you are an entrepreneur, or you're developing your own personal brand, telling your story effectively can make the difference between celebrating milestones and collecting unemployment. The Storytellers Network strives to help storytellers tell their stories so you can learn from the best. Now, your host, the inbound evangelist himself, Dan Moyle. Welcome to the show. I'm Dan. I'm your host, and I'm so excited you're here as we are getting close to the end of the Inspirational Storytellers uh, season. I have quite the inspirational storyteller today and some inspirational stories, uh, and I cannot wait to get there. Before we get there, though, one quick reminder. The website is where everything is, thestorytellersnetwork.com contact information for me, more resources, more podcast episodes. It's all there. So visit the website. And if you're new, uh, text storytellers to 31996 so you can subscribe. I'll send you a text back from that service and uh, let you subscribe, whether it's through Apple, the website, or Android type stuff, Google Play. Uh, it's all there. So there you go. Now, the inspirational storyteller today is Tom Ziegler. Now, he runs the Ziegler Media Empire, of course, helping the legacy of his dad, Zig Ziegler, live on. Now, as CEO of Ziegler and key collaborator on his father's 30th book, Born to Win, Tom carries on the organization's profoundly simple philosophy. I quote it often in some way. I usually butcher it. But the philosophy is you can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. And, uh, and that's just, man, I find that more true every day. Now, Tom also takes the stage himself. He addresses leadership of all levels and all parts of the country and around the world. He co-hosts the podcast, The Ziggler Show, with Kevin Miller, uh, who was my guest from season two, actually. He's definitely an inspirational storyteller and has so many stories to tell. So let's get to Tom Ziggler's stories. Tom, thanks for joining me for the Storytellers Network. Uh, I know you're a busy guy, so this hour is very valuable. So thank you. Thank you, Dan. I'm excited. So Tom, let me ask you, do you consider yourself a storyteller, first of all? You know, I do. Um, uh, and I was raised on stories, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's how I grew up and, and people remember stories yeah. and, you know, it's even getting around all the Ziegler clan. I mean, going back to aunts and uncles when I was little, it was who could tell the best story. So, Yeah. So it comes a little bit natural to to you, obviously your dad as well as a, a legendary storyteller, but it's it's that familial thing, huh? Yeah, it is. It's in the genes. It's in the blood. Right up. Now, what, when did it kind of hit you that you could be a storyteller professionally? When did you feel like this this can be an actual career for me? I started doing presentations and speaking about eight years ago, reluctantly. <laughs> You know, I was the guy that prepared the stage for the world's best. You know, I was the president, the behind the scenes guy. And people said, hey, Tom, you should speak. And, and, uh, and when I first went out the first, first year, I was very anxious, nervous, didn't feel right. Uh, and then I realized I'd put this thing in my head, this, you know, the most powerful story in the world is the one you tell yourself, right? Mm. So the story I was telling myself was, oh, they want me to be like my dad. And then I realized, no, that's not the story. That's not what people want. You know, that's not what their expectation is. Their expectation is for me to have the same principles and values as dad, but just to be the best version of myself, right? Because if you try to fake it, if you try to be somebody you're not, nobody's buying that. And it's uncomfortable. It's not fun. <laughs> Right. So that's when I got comfortable when I said, you know what, I'm going to own who I am and I'm just going to tell stories 
the way they come from me and improve on that. And then that's about six and a half years ago. That's when it started getting fun. Hmm. That's pretty interesting. And that's part of why, you know, I wanted to talk to you is that not only are you your own accomplished inspirational storyteller now, but you took that well-known story on that of your dad, Zig Ziglar. So, so obviously it was a little bit nerve wracking, but what, how else was that for you? Was that difficult living in his shadow and coming out of it? Like, how was that? For me, it's, it's not been difficult. Um, like for a long time, I would finish my speech, uh, the proud son of Zig Ziglar. And I don't, I mean that as much, but I don't say it as much. Uh, and I, and I still tell a ton of stories, uh, about dad. And every now and then somebody will say, Hey, you've got your own stories. You know, I want to hear more of your stories. And I'm like, wait a second, all the stories I tell about dad, I was in them. <laughs> <laughs> right? Truth. And, and so it's our stories. Right. And, and so I think that's really important. It's, it's, uh, you, you don't want to just repeat somebody else's story. That's, that's their story. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you were a part of that story, then that makes it your story too. Uh, and so that's been an evolution in the beginning, you know, when you just get started, you just say what you know and you, and, and here's the thing, you don't know how to look for stories until you've given stories from a stage or in a group and you start picking up on what really resonates with people. And then the next time you're around or in a situation, you, it's like, you see this unfolding. You're like, I'm going to remember this. Hmm because this is a good story, but you don't know to look for it until you've been out there and had that experience. And how difficult is that to have one side of your brain telling a story, the other side receiving everything coming in and thinking, I have to file this away for later is how do you develop that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. I'll tell you what just happened. Uh, I was speaking in Grand Rapids and this was January 3rd and I'm about to go on stage and this guy comes out of the audience and he says, can I take a selfie? His name is Nathan. So I was like, sure. And I go, what's up? He goes, well, my dad was a big fan of your dad's. In fact, they met and he wanted, he knows that you're here and he wanted to make sure that I got to say hello and got a picture with you. And I go, great. What was the story? You know, what happened? He says, Oh, 25 years ago, your dad spoke in Baton Rouge. That's where we're from. And my dad waited in line to get your dad's autograph. And when he came up, your dad asked my dad, what do you do? And my dad's a pastor. He said, I'm a pastor. He said, your dad stopped the whole line, talked to my dad for three or four minutes, and then asked my dad to pray for him. Oh. And so I'm about to go on stage, right? It's like two minutes until I go up. So I look at him and I go, dude, you got to pray for me right now. <laughs> okay. Because how cool is that, that his dad prayed for my dad and now he's praying for me. And so the next, well, I spoke in Tampa yesterday and I told that story because that is a story of legacy right? I mean, that's what we all want, right? Someday we want our kids to run into somebody else's kid and then they're going to tell a story about us and their dad that has that kind of context to it. And so while that was unfolding, I'm like, this is, I mean, this is a God thing and it's such a great story. I got to, you know, it just sunk in. This is going to be, this is what life is about. And people want to hear stories of what life is about. And, and I love, Tom, what you said about it being a story about legacy. Because it makes me think, who really impacted whom more? The pastor or the speaker, right? And so this, this guy who's a pastor who does amazing work out there but isn't well-known on the stage and everything else, and, and probably a little bit by design. He doesn't want that, that, that chance for an ego, right? But but he's impacting lives in a way, but your dad has impacted millions of lives, but his life was so impacted by it. So that, that legacy thing is amazing. How, how do you frame that for yourself rather than just tell the story? Hey, this is what happened. It was pretty cool. Now let's move on. You go back and you say it's a legacy story and you frame it that way. Do you do like deep thinking each day to think about the events that happened to you and how to frame them? Or is it a natural thing for you? 
for me, it's a, it's a little bit more natural. Um, but I know the framework of before and after of the benefits of choosing this and the consequences of choosing that, right? The impact of doing nothing. Um, people, you know, they might see the beginning or they might see the end, but they don't see the middle. And so, and, and I say much stories inside of stories. And so in this context, one of my early, I had two slides and one of them is mom and dad, mom is 16, dad's 18. He's in a sailor outfit. She's looking up in his eyes. I mean, it is the ultimate world war two love story picture between a 16 and 18. Right. And then the next slide is them where dad is 78, mom is 76 and they're just beaming and you can tell they've just lived an amazing life, right? I mean, it's just like, wow. And then I go, and then I tell some other stuff, and then I show those two pictures again, except for, I, said it, I say it this way. I say, look at mom and dad, 16 and 18. What you don't see is that when dad was five, his father died. He had to go to work when he was six, selling peanuts on the corner. He never did well in school. He went in the Navy. He got out of the Navy and went into sales, didn't sell anything. By the way, his mom had a fifth grade education. He was the 10th of 12 kids raised in the Great Depression. That's a pretty hard start, right? I mean, that's tough. But you also don't know this about mom. When mom was 10, she heard a gunshot in the other room. She goes in and her father had committed suicide. And I show that young couple up there and then I show the old picture again in the 70s. So what happened? I mean, today, if this couple were to get together, the sociologists, the psychologists, all the experts would say they've got no chance. And yet dad impacted millions of lives. And he said he never would have impacted anyone if it hadn't been for mom. What was different? What were the choices they made? Right. And so, and so you frame the context of, of course, it's hard. It's unfair. Things happen beyond our control. Sometimes we make really bad decisions and we've got to suffer the consequences, but we always have that ability to make a new decision, a new choice, and to start doing things that put us in a position where we can make a difference. So I tell that story is like the bookend, right? Everybody sees the, the before and after, oh, that's awesome. And then they hear the cool story about the pastor and dad and me and the son in the middle. And then they realize, wait a second, that's not, that's not their story. That's my story, right? Because I don't know anybody who's got a few years on them that hadn't been hit by the Mack truck. Right. Is that why stories are so powerful? Is it that seeing yourself in them? It is. It's, it's, it's identity. So I'm kind of a, um, my friend, he said, Tom, you're an intellectual engineer. And so I got the big head, you know, and I Googled intellectual engineer and there's an acronym for it. The acronym is N E R D nerd. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so I am studying and I'm trying to figure out because you, I know this happened to you. It happens to everybody. You go in here, a great speaker and they get you all excited and you take a lot of notes and then you leave. And then six months later, your notebook falls open. You see the notes and you're like, wow, that was some good stuff. I should have done that. <laughs> That's right. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And yet every day we get testimonials from people whose lives were changed by Zig Ziglar. And I often would wonder, well, what was the difference in his presentation that got people to take action? Versus that other guy that got me excited, but I didn't do anything. And this is what dad's secret was. I was reading the talent code by Daniel Coyle. And it was about how the brain works and what makes a champion a champion. You know, really the top in any industry or any athletic adventure or academics or whatever, doesn't matter. What, what is it that allows them to perform at such a high level? And there's this thing called identity. And they did a little test in the, in the classroom in college. And they, this professor taught uh, a branch of algebra. 
And he said, we're going to study a new branch of algebra today. It was discovered by John Edwards, 1852, Edinburgh, Scotland. And then he teaches how to do the equation. Then he passes out the test. And in the test, uh, half the class got a biography in the middle of the test of John Edwards, and it had his birthday on it. And what they did is they put the birthday of the person they handed the test to, they made it the same. So the, the student would get it and go, oh, look, John Edwards had the same birthday as me. The other half, the class, the birthday was random, and they filmed them. The kids that had the same birthday worked on the problems 30% longer. And so impact and storytelling is transparency where you tell your story of how things didn't go right. These are the mistakes that I made. These are the scars that I have. Somebody gave me this advice. I took it. It got me out of the hole. And what happens is instead of seeing you as this elevated expert author on the stage who I could never be like, you suddenly think, well, if Zig can, I can too. Because every time dad told his story, he talked about his tough beginning. And I really think that was the difference. I really think they loved what he said. They took it home and they took some of his advice, but they tried it 30% longer. And the 30% longer was just enough time to get a result. And then they said, well, I'll try the next thing. And so I think that's the impact of, of story. And it has to do with authentic, you know, authenticity, transparency around the struggles that we've had that make us real enough to where the listener can say, wow, if they can, maybe I can. Identity. Mm -hmm. So that was, a, to me, that was like the secret thing. I knew all the other technical stuff that dad was doing, but it was creating the identity. Hey, we're, we're the same. We've, we've, you know, my challenges are different than your challenges because they're always different, but you had it hard. I've, I had it hard and this is what I did. Now you have the, the legendary Zig to look to for that. And you have Google to go look this up and learn. <laughs> how did, how did your dad know that? Like, mm. how is that such a, an amazing talent that he had? Did, I mean, did he know that that was the, the connection or did it just work for him? Do you think? Um, I call it what I just shared with you. I called it Zig Ziglar's secret influence formula. The formula is hope, identity, will, skill, and refill. And so if you want to have influence, first you create hope, right? That something can something good and positive can happen. You create hope. If there is no hope, they won't try. Second is identity, which we just explained. And then he always said, in order to have success, You've got to work on the will and the skill every day. So will is the want to, the desire, the attitude, the heart, the passion, the motivation. The skill is the how to, the process, the technique. And so to be successful, we've got to have the right attitude and the right skill, right? And refill means we do it every day. And so when dad was starting, uh, he started in direct sales. And he, for many years, he sold stainless steel, waterless cookware. So these today, these sets of cookware sell for two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000. And back then they would sell them in uh, dinner parties. So dad had like close to an hour long presentation that he had memorized. And he would do a cooking demonstration and tell stories all the way through it. He estimated that he did about 3,000 of these. And so what happened is, you, you know it by heart after 100 or two, right? He knew it so well that he no longer focused on the story that in the, what he was saying. He focused on the people in the room. And so when you begin to get so comfortable with your presentation that you can focus on the countenance and the expression and the feedback in the room, then you can go where the room needs to go. And so he didn't have, you know, Google or research to back him up. He had thousands of presentations getting feedback 
that he was attuned to that taught him? Practice, practice and empathy and self-awareness is kind of what it's, what it sounds like. Yeah, pretty much, man. That's incredible. Um, so you mentioned earlier, Tom, that, that you were, when, when dad was still speaking and doing all this, that you were president behind the scenes guy. Did you know from an early age that this would be your path or did this just like, how does that work with a brand as big as Zig, as Ziggler, as Zig Ziggler? Did that, did that just come like common sense to you? You were like, yeah, I'm going to do this someday. Or how did that work? No, uh, when I went to college, uh, loved it, played college golf, thought I was going to be a professional golfer, um, traveled and played for a year after I graduated and never got to that level. I mean, that was my desire. I played in a lot of tournaments with the people, with people who ended up on tour and there was a huge gap between me and them. (laughs) I mean, I mean, if you don't know golf, you don't see much difference, right? But when you know golf and you just see the difference, it's just, it's, it's like in any field. Yeah. And, and so I was working at the company at that time and I worked my way from the warehouse to production. I used to make the cassette tapes back in the day, Nice. Uh, manufacture them and, and all that. And then I moved into sales and I fell in love with sales. And then I was at an event. And I met somebody at an event whose life had been changed and they told me their story. And that's what hooked me. Mm. That's when I realized that we weren't in the book and tape business. We were in the life changing business. Great so, realization to have happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love, so one of the stories that I love that I've heard you tell, um, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get it exactly right. Cause it's been so long since I've, I've listened to it. When I first reached out to you, I, I listened to it and then things have come out and out of my head, but you tell a story about, in your dad's later years when you were on the road with him and kind of one of the lessons that he taught you, do you know which one I'm referring to? It's one of your keynotes. I think there's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of lessons. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. There, there was, it was, yeah, it just, I mean, for any listeners go, go to Tom's page. We'll link to it in the show notes. Look at some of the keynotes, watch them. They're the clips from keynotes and <clears throat> you know, this oh, word, yeah, this, I know what you're one you're talking about. <clears throat> do you? Yeah. We're, you, we're you on the air. Sh- or when you're on the airplane. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so it was the yeah. airplane. Do you mind sharing that? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we were going, I think we were going out to Las Vegas and dad was a master traveler. I mean, he would traveled millions of miles for his life. And so he had a routine. We'd, we'd get on the plane. He had his manila folder with his notes in, and he'd sit it right next to the seat. And he'd put a seatbelt on, he'd call the flight attendant over and he'd say, hey, I'm going to take a nap. And dad would fall asleep while people are boarding the plane. And the plane would taxi, it would take off, dad would be sound asleep. And he would be asleep until the wheels folded underneath the plane. You know that eh, sound, that hydraulic sound? And then he would wake up. And then he would get his manila folder out and he'd start working. And so I said, dad, I knew what he was doing, but I wanted to hear him again. Right. Because I was really trying to listen this time. I said, dad, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm working on my speech for tomorrow. And I said, dad, you've given that speech 2000, 3000 times. I mean, think about it. I've been doing it for 40 years. Why are you working on it? And he worked on every speech at least three hours, even if he'd given it the day before and the day before and the day before. He said, son, the reason I do that is PC, persistent consistency. And I said, okay, so what does that mean? He says, well, consistency means that when there's something that you, that's valuable that you want to attain, you work on it every day or as, or as often as necessary. Persistency means that whenever you work on it, you take it up a notch. And he said, son, the reason I do this is because for some people, it'll be the very first time they've ever heard me speak. I've got one chance to make a first impression. I want this to be the best speech I've ever given, right? So he's reviewing it. So that's consistency, right? That's his consistent goal. Then he says, and a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to the CEO, the VP of sales, the VP of marketing. It's their big meeting. And they were telling me their goals for the year, the theme for the year. And they wanted me to incorporate some of that into the talk. Plus, I was reading in the newspaper last week about their industry. And there's this challenge coming on. 
but I see how it could be an advantage for them. So I'm going to weave that in to the talk. I'm going to weave those things in. And, and he said that way, maybe one person in that room will realize that I took the time to make this speech just about them in the room. And maybe that's the thing that will get them to take my advice on one thing that ends up changing their life. And that's how he built his career. So think about that. If we lived our professional life, anything with persistent consistency, where we were every day we were doing consistently something that would get us closer to our goal. And then while we were doing it, we just took it up a notch. We did a little bit extra and that's what he did. I like that so much better than the, the, the hustle that everybody talks about. Just hustle. Like this sounds so much more purposeful and just smart. So yeah. yeah, thanks for sharing that. And, and, and I like what you said too, at the beginning time that, that you, you knew the story, you knew why, but you wanted to hear it because you were really listening this time and how powerful that is. So right. that, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I've, I've noticed the older I get, the worse my hearing, but the better listener I am. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I try to listen so much differently now. You know, my, my, my grandfather, my, my last living grandparent, call him every week and just listen even if it's the same story about the weather, like I just want to get one more thing from him, you know, and, and know that he, know that he's still talking to me. Um, yeah. The, the old, the older I get, the more I listen. Absolutely. What do you, what kind of challenges does the storytelling life present to you? What have you seen over the years? Hmm. The storytelling life. Uh, the biggest cultural change is people's um, attention span. Yeah. Um, so it's much harder to grab somebody's attention. And it seems like there's an overemphasis on painting the perfect image. You, you know, one of the stories that I tell is uh, about Facebook. And I'll ask, you know, a mixed audience, I'll say, hey, how many of you have a photo album from the, from the 80s or the 90s? And, of course, everybody does. I say, I challenge you to do this. Go back into your photo album and look at the girls in the photo album between 12 and 17. And what you'll discover is they don't wear makeup. They have T-shirts on. Their hair is in ponytail, and they're all smiling and having fun. Now go to Facebook and look at any picture of a girl between 12 and 17. It's all perfect. They have to be Instagram ready, right? They just don't know. And that's, to me, that's a little metaphor for uh, the way we relate these days. You know, we've got these electronic barriers and the ability to put on masks, but I think that our younger generations, millennials and younger, they can see through a mask in a heartbeat. And so I think the way you, you kind of penetrate that, you know, get people to, is you go as quick as you can to the conversations that people are scared to have. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's a bit scary time. I don't know if I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> now, when you say scary to have, I mean, is that just, is that another way of looking at basically looking at authenticity? Be yeah. authentic with people? Yeah. Well, it's one of the things that I did yesterday. Uh, I spoke at a convention and then they were, were doing some, uh, some little side shots with a camera and they interviewed us on leadership and things like that. And so he asked me a leadership question and I went straight to the spiritual. That's like totally natural for me. Mm -hmm. And when we get done, he comes up and he goes, wow, it was so refreshing to have somebody talk about something that nobody thinks they can talk about. Why is that? And I kind of smiled at him and I said, well, somebody famous once said, I've done the math. You're going to be dead a whole lot longer than you're going to be alive. So your faith is important. <laughs> so amen to that, you know? And so I think, uh, being authentic, being transparent. And the other thing too, is that it's, uh, it's, it's how you say it and the intent that you have that makes the difference. Uh, I see a lot of people use the truth as a hammer. 
Mm-hmm. And that doesn't work. You've got to speak the truth in love. And when you do that, when your motive is right, it's amazing. I was in Australia and Australia is, is I love Australia, but man, it is, you do not talk about politics or faith from the stage. I mean, you just don't do it. Really? Um, at least that's what they tell you. So I'm down there doing an all day deal and, and, uh, we had a package of all of our materials and it was about a $500 package. And of course I talked about faith during the day because in Ziegler, we talk about the seven areas of life, the mental, the spiritual, the physical, the family, the financial, the personal, and the career. Well, one of those areas is spiritual. So what, we're not going to talk about spiritual because it's taboo down there. No, we just talk about it and we do it in love. So this guy comes up to me at the end and he's got the package. The package is so big. It takes two big bags to hold it. Right. So he comes up to me and he's holding these two big bags and he looks at me and he goes, Hey, I really enjoyed today. He goes, but I'm just curious. He goes, you know, I'm an atheist and wouldn't you make more sales if you didn't mention your faith? He didn't see the irony there. (laughs) So I started (laughs) dipping my head and and looking at the two bags. (laughs) He goes, Oh, I guess I get it now. (laughs) So the, the point is it's like, I've got a lot of friends who are, you know, agnostic or atheist or different uh, beliefs and we get along great. And it's, and it's, and it's because of how they present what they believe. It's not that I have to agree with what they believe or they have to agree with what I believe, but, but I know that, you know, they're just, they're just real and transparent and, and this is, this is where they are. And so, you know, they're not beating me over the head with it. So that doesn't offend me at all. You know, what makes you run? What, you know, what gives you a good night's sleep? What, what gets you up in the morning excited for what you do? I want to know what the answer is and it's okay. Whatever their answer is. So it's amazing that you can have close friends that with whom you disagree, but be respectful and, and how that, how that can add to your life. I mean, that's huge. Yeah. Uh, right. <laughs> well, dad and I had a lot of conversations about the word tolerance and he was not a fan of tolerance. It's, it's our culture's like number one virtue tolerance. Uh, I don't, I don't like tolerance either. And the way that we talked about it was this tolerance is a cop out. There's no risk in it. If somebody's driving their car down the road, and there's a dead end and a cliff. Tolerance means you, you just wave at them as they go by. Love takes risk. Love says, I've been down that road. It's not fun. So you run out into the road. You wave them down at the, re- at the risk of a relationship. You say, hey, I care about you. You, you might want to, you know, turn left or right, but don't go straight. Right? So that's love. And so here's the true test. Do you want your children to tolerate you or do you want them to love you? Hmm. We want, we want the love. And so sometimes when I speak in these mixed groups and, and academic institutions, I'll, I'll say this, I'll say, look, I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. I don't care if you know, what part of the world you're from, whether you believe in God or a different God or no God at all. I don't care what lifestyle you live. I don't even care if you don't like the Dallas Cowboys. (laughs) Is it okay if I just love you? I mean, isn't that better than me tolerating you? (laughs) It's a great way to frame it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And so now look, there's a lot of people I love that we have different opinions, but it doesn't change the fact that I love them. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I can't argue the Cowboys thing. I'm I'm not too far from Detroit. So the lions aren't going to hold, of course for me, it's hockey. So it's the Red Wings, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> so the stars, we might have a problem there. Um, <laughs> although the stars used to be a, 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 a parent team to the Kalamazoo wings. So I got some love for Texas. It's all right. Yeah, there you go. Anyway, it's fun. Um, they might they might do something this year. Who knows? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the 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 wings won't. They're um, yeah, they're hurting. So where, when it comes to 
I mean, you kind of covered this a little bit, but I, but I want to know if this is if, where it's going to go, where I think when it comes to stories, whether you're writing something new, you're sharing from the stage or, or whatever you're doing, where does inspiration come from for you? Hmm. Um, so I've just finished, uh, writing my book, uh, choose to win. And so there was this whole process of the idea of a story. And then I'm lucky cause I do webinars every week. I speak constantly. And so I get to test all the stories out right? And you, you get to shape them and mold them and figure out, you know, the timing on them. And then now the book comes. And so now you're trying to figure out how does this translate into print, right? How do you, how do you move it over? And so the inspiration for the story, there's usually that initial, uh, like, wow, that's a story. Like what happened in Grand Rapids? Like I knew as that unfolded, when he said, my dad prayed for your dad, I was like, that's a story, right? Because it had so many levels, you know, it had, Hey, isn't it cool that my dad met your dad now meeting you? And then it, isn't it cool that, you know, my dad uh, prayed for your dad now, isn't it really cool that I'm praying for you? And isn't it cool that the main focus of all at Ziegler is legacy. I mean, it's just like layer after layer. And so some stories will naturally just come baked in. They'll have all the layers and you're like, man, that's, that's a great story. Other stories you might have to tell or work on a dozen times before you, you, you kind of get that right component. And so inspiration to me, it's not always, you know, bam, that's it. Right. Sometimes it's a connector that changes it. So I'll, I'll just give you an example. Um, in the book, I talk about, uh, the, the, the subtitle is transform your life one simple choice at a time. And I talk about the seven spokes in the wheel, the, the mental, the physical, the spiritual, I go through all seven in this, in the physical chapter, I say you need, in order to be in good physical health, there's three pillars. There's what you eat, there's how much you sleep, and there's how much movement you get. That's pretty basic stuff. And we don't get enough sleep. We, we don't get, um, we need at least seven hours. So I know all that. And then I know that I should create a habit that puts me to, that gets my brain in sleep mode about an hour before I actually go to sleep. Because if my brain's not turned off, if I'm on the screen and all that stuff is going on and I lay down, I may fall asleep, but I'm not going to go deep sleep. So I know all that. So here's the story. So we have devotions at our company and this guy named Jim Gardner gets up and he says, do you have a pre-sleep routine? And he talks about, so, uh, you know, you can dim your, your iPhone at a certain time and you can change the light waves and you can do all this stuff. And he says, really? Cause we got to have deep sleep. So I think, well, that's good. Well then about a week later, I'm listening to Rabbi Daniel Lappin, who I love. And he says that in the Samson and Delilah story that, uh, there's, this is where Samson is being deceived by Delilah and she keeps, you know, trying to figure out his source of source of power. And he keeps teasing her with, well, it's this and it's that. Well, then the last two incidents is in, in the, and I think it's in Judges 16. I can't remember exactly. Anyway, she, the, the la second to last one, he said, well, if you weave my hair, I'll lose my power. So she does that. The Philistines come in. She wakes him up, and it says, and Samson awoke and took care of the Philistines. The second time, she cut his hair. It took his power. and she, she said, the Philistines are here. And then it says, and Samson awoke and the spirit of God had left him. So in English, the word awoke is exactly the same for both instances. But in Hebrew, the first word for awoke had two vowels in it. And one of those vowels was a spiritual connotation. And it meant that the spirit of God was in Samson. So the first time, 
He still had his power. The spirit of God was in him. The second time in Hebrew, the word awoke only had one vowel in it. And what it meant was the spirit of God had left him. And what that word means in the physical context is you literally wake up with a big yawn and you go, I wonder what's going to happen today. And so I connected those two things. So here's the story. The reason we have a pre-sleep routine is because we wake up for a purpose and the Spirit of God is in us. So it may not seem like a big deal to get your cell phone in the right mode and to turn off social media and to start spending time with your family and turn the TV off an hour before you go to bed until you realize you were created for a purpose engineered for success, you know, it's endowed with the seeds of greatness. You've got all these things in you. God has big plans for you. And the only way you can reach your capacity, the only way that you can fulfill and claim the territory that's yours, change the lives of the people you come across, is if you go to sleep knowing you're waking up with a purpose. And all of a sudden, the Hebrew makes a lot of sense, right? Because some people wake up with the Spirit of God in them, and some of the people wake up wondering, what am I going to do? For some people, life happens to them. For other people, they happen to life. It's a great way to, great way to wrap that up. Yeah, Rabbi Lappin is, is a legend as well. So you've, <laughs> you've, you've got the right inspiration. What do you think for, for any storyteller out there who's thinking, okay, I, I want to find my inspiration. You know, uh, some, some days my inspiration comes from a, a, a random muse or whatever. Some days it's, it's my routine. Other days it's sitting down and lighting the candles to, to sit down and write. And I think that's my inspiration. What kind of advice would you give to storytellers looking for inspiration? Where, where should they start? You, know, you have yours and you have all these stories and things that happen around you that you can pull from. How should we find our inspiration today? Well, the, I've, I talk about creating the perfect start. And all that really means is, is I set aside time every single morning. And this is a habit, right? This is an intentional thing. And so in my perfect start, I spend a few minutes with God. I read some devotionals. I work on my goals. I do some mental modeling. And then whatever my most important thing is, I've set aside time to do that one thing after. And I think the reason that we, we feel like, Oh, I don't have any inspiration or inspiration is hard to find is we haven't made it a priority. We haven't intentionally carved out the time for it to happen. And so if you notice in my routine, it's almost, it's, I get quiet. I pray, I meditate. I, I input the good stuff. I read different things. Uh, if, and during this time, if something's happened over the, the previous days or weeks, it's profound. It gives me that time to let it sink in. So what does that mean? And then a lot of times my, my one thing is to write or to create something. And so that further develops it. And so it's very easy to think that there is a magical inspirational thing that's going to happen. That's going to light us up when it's far more common that we need to develop the eyes to see, Oh, that could be a good story. This is how dad wrote his books. So uh, they want him to write a book on family and he wanted him to write a book on marriage. So he started thinking about it and he wrote 10 or 12 things that he thought would be good topics or good chapters in that book. And then everything he read, newspaper, magazine, articles, if it fit, he would just cut it out and he would put it in a folder behind whatever chapter it would go in. And he collected information like this for like a year. And so now it's time to really get down and start digesting. Well, he's been taking these different ideas and he's been testing them out in speeches along the way. But when it gets time to produce the book, He's got this huge file of all these things, all these stories, all these notes. And then when he would talk to people and they would tell him his story, right? They would tell him, this is what happened to me, or this is how I overcame this. He would hear it and he would look him in the eye and say, can you do me a favor? Could you write me a letter with that in it? Cause I'd love to use it. 
for those of you who want to tell stories and you hear a good story, ask the person if they would take the time to write you a letter or in today's crazy world, invite them on your podcast and ask them to tell their story. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So it sounds like you've, uh, uh, are familiar with Jay Papasan and Gary Keeler is the one thing. Is oh yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm rereading that right now. And, and same thing, like focus on that one thing first because the rest of the day you're going to be sat of energy. So powerful. Yeah. Um, Tom, it's been incredible, man. I appreciate your time today. If I want to, I want to get this last one out because this is, this is my favorite one and I want to see your reaction. Um, if someone said to you tomorrow, you can no longer be a storyteller what would your last story be that you'd want to finish up with? Oh, you should have warned me about that one. <laughs> it's my favorite. <laughs> if I could no longer be a storyteller, what would be my last story? It would, uh, it would be a long one. Let me just tell you that. You know, somebody asked me, what would your last meal be? And I told him it'd be a buffet. I mean, it would be the biggest buffet in the history of man. Uh, so the, the story I would tell would be a story that would start with hope. Cause I truly believe that uh, you were created for a purpose. And then I would give evidence of that and throughout the, the stories within the stories. And then I would show them the path to it. I think that's Cause that's the greatest story ever told. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, I'm going, I want as many as people as possible to go with me. That is, that is our calling. Jesus <laughs> said, go, right. He didn't say, wait, he said, go that's right. bring it, bring everybody with you. Yeah. Fantastic, Tom. Thank you so much for your time today, man. Um, so where can people best find you to get the book, the podcast, the inspiration, the videos? How, how can they connect with you? The book is real simple. It's at choose to win book.com. Ziggler.com is all everything we have. The Ziggler show is the podcast. And if you want a connection or if you have questions, we do sort of, we certify people to go out and teach our material and we do all kinds of stuff. Ziggler.com is the way to go. Uh, but I'm one of these crazy guys. My email is Tom at Ziggler.com. And so I even answer email. <laughs> it's true. It's true. You, you even took my email. So <laughs> Even though Kevin probably warned you, he was on one of the early seasons. Like, man, don't talk to Dan, but you did. So thank you. No. <laughs> Excellent. We'll put all that in the show notes for you. And uh, man, again, Tom, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Be blessed. Thank you. I can't say it enough. I'm so appreciative of Tom coming on the show. Thank you, Tom. You can connect with him at the links in the show notes. Everything we mentioned is there. Everything he mentioned is there. Uh, if you enjoyed the episode and got something out of it, please share it with someone, whether it's someone who was a fan of Zig Ziglar, someone who's a fan of the Ziglar Empire, someone who could use some inspiration, social media, email, text, however you could share it. Much appreciated and just helps get the word out. Uh, and if you want to share your story with me in some way, just contact me on my contact page on the storytellersnetwork.com. Send me an email and we'll have us a chat. Thank you for listening so much. I appreciate it. Until next time, here's to telling our stories and having those stories to tell. Cheers. Thank you.